The following is a presentation of the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. Hello, I'm Henry Taylor, and I'm privileged to be talking with Mark Strand, the Poet Laureate of the United States. The Poet Laureateship of the United States grew out of a position that's existed for something like 40 years, I guess, the Poetry Consultant to the Library of Congress. So your actual title is something like Poet Laureate Poetry Consultant with no punctuation. It's uh, too cumbersome. Something like that, yeah. Most people call me PL. Right, that's fair <laughs> enough. Mr. Strand's poems began to appear in books in 1964 with uh, Sleeping with One Eye Open, which is a very handsome little limited edition. I don't know how limited, but it's very hard to find now. Oh, you can't find it. Yeah, that's too bad because it's a wonderful book. It, ha it's a, for, it has a, a durability. The poems in it seem to me to show up in anthologies and deserve to be there. Uh, more often than is usual with people's first books oh. who have gone on to, to do very distinguished work later on. I mean, there have been, what, six books since of poetry. Yeah. Well, I was lucky, I guess. Although it's hard to sort of be known for the poems in your first book. You know, you wish that they... You would, would like them to... Be, you'd like to, the anthologist to sort of pick the poems from your latest book. Oh, sure. But we there's all, always that yeah. time lag. Yeah, everybody likes their, mo their most recent work yeah. best. And, but, and I have to confess that I like your most recent work best. Thank um, you. The Continuous Life, which is just out uh, in 1990. Last year. Yeah. Last year. Uh, seems to me to have more of your best poems in it than any other book, except maybe selected poems, which, which is cheating because it's picking from poems from all books, the other yeah. ones. Yeah. When you first started out, you wrote some poems that were uh, intricate in form in cer certain ways, yeah. but not, not traditionally formal in the sense that they were sonnets, sonnets or, or yeah. something like that. But the title poem of Sleeping with One Eye Open uh, has some characteristics that I think are um, unusual in that it's, very, it's, a, it's a difficult form where you have a sort of normal length line followed immediately by a very short line and those two lines will rhyme so that the rhyme comes very suddenly. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're together. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could read that for us. And, sure. Uh, Be happy so, to. So. Sleeping with one eye open. Unmoved by what the wind does, the windows are not rattled nor do the various areas of the house make their usual racket, creak at the joints, trusses, and studs. Instead, they are still, and the maples able at times to raise havoc evoke not a sound from their branches' clutches. It's my night to be rattled, saddled with spooks, even the half-moon, half-man, half-dark, on the horizon, lies on its side, casting a fishy light which alights on my floor, lavishly lording its morbid look over me. Oh, I feel dead, folded away in my blankets for good and forgotten. My room is clammy and cold, moon-handled and weird. The shivers wash over me, shaking my bones. My loose ends loosen, and I lie sleeping with one eye open, hoping that nothing, nothing will happen. Now, there are a few poems that that, I, that every time I see them or hear them, they remind me very strongly of the first time I ever saw them and how I felt mm -hmm. when I saw them. This is the kind of thing I like. And, I, and that, I was at Hollins College, I think, as a graduate student when I first saw that poem. And thought, yeah, that's, that, the ending of that is just right. Um, the, the, the rhymes are not exact most of the time, no. or are they ever? I've, um, no, they're, they're close. They're slant rhymes. Slant rhymes. They, like and they, various areas. Areas. Yeah. And they cover not one syllable, but two, sometimes three. And I tried in the short lines to uh, make the whole line a kind of rhymed version of the end of the line before it. And mm -hmm. it's not something I invented. 
I really got it from a poem of Lewis McNeese's called Sunlight in the Garden. Oh, sure. Hardens and grows, and grows cold. cold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy to have sat under thunder and rain with you. Happy too for sunlight in the garden. And you just take it one step further by uh, breaking the, putting the line end right after the echo rhyme. Yeah. Right, going on from and going there. Going on, and yeah. I, I wrote it as a student, and very often I would, I was bored in class and would keep long lists of, of rhymes. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought of writing another such poem, but thought, I'd rather have you know, just one so elaborately rhymed, have it be an idiosyncratic poem. And uh, although I do like rhyming, and I have thought of writing um, sestinas and sonnets in which I use the same kind of rhyme, like, for example, galoises, galoshes, goulashes. Ah. Oh, yes, that would be fun. Uh, yeah. You know, that sort of thing, yeah. or uh, Hebrews, highbrows. You know. Well, what happened? It seems to me you you did you establish your you establish your sort of ability to do this. You say, well, see, here's this poem. I I yeah. I, I can do this. Yeah. And but that's not my only reason for putting this poem in here. It's a good poem. I like this poem. This is me. Yeah. But so is this. And from the, in the late '60s and all pretty much through the '70s, it seems to me most of your work was free verse, like most of the work that was being done. I guess. Yeah. Well, I was uh, a follower in that regard. I wanted to do pretty much what other people were doing. I wanted the kind of acceptance they wanted. I wanted to be part of the mainstream. And I don't say this proudly or happily. It's, I consider it a weakness in my um, character that I uh, gave up something that I actually enjoyed doing so that I could be one of the guys, uh -huh. and I... Um, but you were younger enough than, say, well, Tony was, Hecht or, or Richard Wilbur to not, you, you, to be able, if, I mean, they could stick by their guns and maybe yeah. people would every now and then say... Well, they were more heavily invested in what they had done than yeah. I was. I, yeah. I really hadn't done much. I'd published some formal poems, but they, I, I had no career really as yet, and I was a beginning poet, and so... Um, I really wanted to do what other people were doing, and you know, I I tried to do it well, and in some cases it worked out. I never lost uh, my interest in rhyme. In fact, I'm going back to it now, and in in the recent book, I there are quite a few th things in rhyme, yeah. and including one ballad, which is mm -hmm. rather an old, a very old-fashioned form. I um, well, in one respect, though, it seems to me, although although you may have followed f uh, in the direction of free verse because of other people, there is one respect in which your poems are very different from anybody else's, and I don't know how to describe it. It would be better maybe if you if you read a poem, but there's there's a there's a kind of spooky quality in mm -hmm. the poems. They're they're very spare, but something just outside the field of vision in some way is clearly going on yeah. that is that is creating a, a, a quality of threatened uh, ness in the in yeah. the poems um, I wonder if you could read uh, keeping things whole which has a little less of that maybe than some yeah. of the other ones but there is something of that in it I think I can uh, recite that one okay uh, keeping things whole in a field I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air, and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. That's a very short poem, but it's a, it's a very powerful one, it seems to me. The, um it, the, the, it develops, it, it, it gets its internal logic set up so quickly and without business uh, that everything, although it's not predictable, clearly follows. Yeah. The air comes in behind the body as the body moves on. And the, the quiet, understated tone of the poem is somehow um, made more nearly desperate by the by the uh, something sort of impossibility of, of the speaker's 
aims. I move yeah. to keep things whole. Is a, it's a scary. Well, that's a yeah. scary thought. Well, the me. charitable at the end there. I move to keep things whole. I mean, as yeah. if the, the intactness of the world were dependent on me. Yes. Yeah. But it, it, one of the, it, as a poem, it was a lucky accident. I was playing cards with another poet late one night and excused myself and went into the kitchen and wrote the poem I just read in its entirely entirety and never changed a word and it just has remained oh, that's that a, poem. One of those one of those gifts. Those gifts like they do yeah. come along once in a once in a while. Yeah. I haven't had many, but that's one. One of the things that you do in it and, and do in a lot of your work, uh, is to it seems to I wonder sometimes if the uh, the attention that a formalist would lavish upon the lines one at a time, mm -hmm. whether you don't do something a little bit like what Robert Frost was talking about when he developed his somewhat overblown theory about sentence sounds. I mean, well, you remember mm -hmm. that uh, he wrote to yes. John Burroughs in the teens, and and. He, he made exaggerated claims for discoveries that he had made about the way a sentence will sound uh, in such a way that you can understand probably what it is saying even though you hear it through a door and can't make out the words. Yeah. That, that there are characteristic r sounds of sentences and that there are ways that you can handle sentence rhythms taking them through line ends. Mm -hmm. That, uh, well, I, I think that's true in all communication, that we, sure. we understand a good deal more than what's being told us, uh, that is, word for word. Mm -hmm. And there, there's that aura that surrounds this particular poem, as you described, it's because there's an, an intimation of more, that um, one can sort of, sort of scrutinize the sentences and find that there's... A, a little bit more there, but I think that's the obligation of poetry is to sort of create that air of of um, moreness. Yes, something something that's beyond the beyond the edges. Yeah, because it's hard to be moved again and again by the particular words. There has to be something that you feel you're on the edge of getting mm -hmm. all the time, yes. and I think that. What we try to do. If you're on the edge of getting, that means you're about to get something, which means that the poem or the language of the poem is holding something in reserve. And I think that that's what poets have learned how to um, write these things that keep something of themselves in reserve to enable the reader to go back and back uh, without being bored. Yes. This is something that uh, I think fiction can't afford to do. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Uh, I, I wish we had time to get into your yeah. theories of narrative, but <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, one thing you said in, in an interview back in the I think early seventies, yeah. maybe middle seventies, uh, was that to the effect. I'm going to misquote you, but I hope it's you'll right. recognize yourself <laughs> um, vaguely. Um, to the effect that you have the problem that probably most poets have, which is that once you've or established a voice for yourself, you are what you have written to some yeah. extent, and you uh, would like nevertheless to change. It would be interesting to change. Not that you dislike what you've done, it's just interesting to keep yeah. changing. Mm -hmm. This is the way I understood what you were saying, and yet change is difficult. Right. Yeah, change is difficult. But it seems to me that you have done it. Um, well, a I think I've of done times. it. I think I've done it, uh, and I think others. Uh, to a certain extent have done it, but I think it's, um, history will have the last word on that. I mean, it takes the long view and looks oh, sure. back and it'll say, he may thought, he may have thought he changed, but really these, There's the beginning and the end of that here. career yes. is, uh -huh. is pretty much the same. And uh, I, I think it's one of the ways writers keep themselves interested in writing. Unless you feel you've changed, uh, you you may feel that you're just repeating yourself, yes, and a slave to uh, you know to the sort of the things you've already learned you've how already to do. You've already established. Yes, I mean that's that's I think of James Wright who suddenly discovered something going very wrong at the ends of his metered lines. Yeah, too many of the same words turning up there over and over and over again, and then yeah, and um, well, you are the prisoner of the words you use too, and. Um, but this is you. I mean, everybody on this earth is 
recognized by not only the way they look, but the turns of phrases they use, the, the language they prefer, when they choose to speak, and about what things they choose to speak. And I think that a radical break with any of that would probably put you in the madhouse. It would become, it would be almost, have to be arbitrary to, 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 to take too strong a change of direction. Yeah. And we're not that free. Right. It would be like Richard Wilbur suddenly deciding to sound like Allen Ginsberg. It's, it's almost Wouldn't impossible to imagine somehow. And even no. though people... Well, he would be locked up immediately. Probably, yeah. And even though back in the 60s, I think people did sort of want him to do that. There were a few critics yeah. who thought it would be nice if he would... I'm glad he didn't. Um, I am too. But one thing that does happen after you had, uh, in your work, uh, that a number of, the, of your poems of the period of... Uh, reasons for moving, yeah. um, have that very spare um, quality and, and gradually things, objects, views, uh, events begin to come back into the poems yeah. uh, as in uh, uh, shooting whales. seems yeah. to me, as I think about it in the abstract, I think of it as a much longer poem than your average and yet it's not. It's, it's fuller. Yeah, there's a That's lot all. going on in that. But poem. I think I think there's time. I think there's time for us to hear that if you would. Sure, read I'd love it for to read us. it. Yeah. It's. Uh, I think the simplicity of a lot of my early poems has to do with my just holding on for dear life, not being able to write sentences that were too complex, and uh, I see. Uh -huh. really just doing what I th thought I could do. Uh, well, you certainly could do it. Shooting whales. When the shoals of plankton swarmed into St. Margaret's Bay, turning the beaches pink, we saw from our place on the hill the sperm whales feeding, fouling the nets in their play, and breaching clean so the humps of their backs rose over the wide sea meadows. Day after day we waited inside for the rotting plankton to disappear. The smell stilled even the wind, and the oxen look stunned, pulling hay on the, sl on the slope of our hill. But the plankton kept coming in, and the whales would not go. That's when the shooting began. The fishermen got in their boats and went after the whales, and my father and uncle and we children went too. The froth of our wake sank fast in the wind-shaken water. The whales surfaced close by, their foreheads were huge. The doors of their faces were closed. Before sounding, they lifted their flukes into the air and brought them down hard. They beat the sea into foam, and the path that they made shone after them. Though I did not see their eyes, I imagined they were like the eyes of morning, glazed with room, watching us sweeping along under the darkening sheets of salt. When we cut our engine and waited for the whales to surface again, the sun was setting, turning the rock-strewn barrens a gaudy salmon. A cold wind flailed at our skin. When finally the sun went down and it seemed like the whales had gone, my uncle, no longer afraid, shot aimlessly into the sky. Three miles out, in the rolling dark, under the moon's astonished eyes, our engine would not start, and we headed home in the dinghy, and my father, hunched over the oars, brought us in. I watched him, wrapped in his effort, rowing against the tide, his blond hair glistening with salt. I saw the slick spillage of moonlight being blown over his shoulders, and the sea in spindrift, suddenly silver. He did not speak the entire way. At midnight, when I went to bed, I imagined the whales moving beneath me, sliding over the weed-covered hills of the deep. They knew where I was. They were luring me downward and downward into the murmurous waters of sleep. That's terrific. Thank you. And is very full of details and recollected, or apparently recollected. Yeah, it's a true story. Scenes. Uh -huh. 
And the, I think the problem in that poem was to sort of keep a story going while having at the same time the stuff of lyric poetry. Right. A, a language that wasn't just uh, notational. Mm hmm Yes. But which evoked in its descriptive capacities a sense of place. Yes. It's, uh, it, it seems to me to be much more nearly like some of the poems in your new book. Uh, the, the people who write the dust jacket flap copy for... Yeah, I didn't. Well, of course not. <laughs> um, but they do point out that it's your first book of poems in ten years. They do not point out that those were ten years in which you did three children's books, uh, two books of art, criticism, yeah. a book of short stories, one book of... Uh, the, the un that the Andrade our, translations were in yeah, there too, right. sometime in there. So this was not a, a decade in which you labored mightily to figure out how to write the next poem and did no. nothing else. No, I did but, a lot of other things trying to figure out what might... Yeah, see what would I come mean, along. Yeah, and I think I, what it did was generate uh, a need in me to get back to poetry. I also discovered what poetry was along the way. I mean, I, mean, I, I think toward the end of the selected poems when I, before I started doing all these other sorts of writing, I was unsure in my free verse what was prose and what was poetry. I had, um, I began to lose confidence in free verse to be, you know, a powerful agent for poetry. And I, uh, that's why as I go back to poetry, my poems are more formal. Ex the and, and is richer. And is that also why there is more um, security or confidence in presenting um, prose items yeah. as as poems, which they as and they work. I mean, there's one wonderful one. We don't have time to read the whole thing, um, but there's a wonderful prose item in this book, the Chekhov, a Sestina, in yeah. which in which simultaneously you get that sort of dithered sound of a character out of Chekhov right. facing a normal sort of social problem with the, with the usual um, set of, of irresoluble alternatives that right. Chekhov characters have. And the, the Sestina end words are repeated at the ends of sentences which can be anywhere from two words to, yeah. to many. Exactly, you've got um, it. The one thing you didn't do is the envoy, which would have been, I guess, a kind of a tricky thing to have to wind up. Yeah, with. I don't but think it, I, uh, <coughs> I ran what out would of you gas there? at the end. Of the uh, but it's a marvelous poem. Um, well, it's fun to try to parody people, especially people you like a great deal. And I thought I, I've always loved Chekhov, and I thought I'd write a little Chekhovian scene, which is that's perfect. It's 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 perfect. Um, I wonder if you could read uh, a couple of shorter poems sure. from, from this book. I was thinking of A.M. Absolutely. Um, which I think... Yeah, I'll read A.M. Many ways, many ways typical of the new way that you're doing things that are in, still in lines. A.M. And here the dark infinitive to feel, which would endure and have the earth be still, and the star-strewn night pour down the mountains into the hissing fields and silent towns until the last insomniac turned in, must end, and early risers see the scarlet clouds break up and golden plumes of smoke from uniform dark homes turn white, and so on down to the smallest blade of grass and fallen leaf touched by the arriving light. Another day has come, another fabulous escape from the damages of night. So even the gulls in the ragged circle of their flight, above the sea's long lanes that flash and fall, scream their approval. How well the sun's rays probe the rotting carcass of a skate. How well they show the worms and swarming flies at work. How well they shine upon the fatal sprawl of everything on earth. How well they love us all. I think it's a. I think it's a very, very long way from those, from sentences like those. Yeah. Um, to the back early, to yeah. in a field, I am the absence of field. Period. I mean, period. That's, this is always the case. And period. period. Yeah. No, and that that's... that poem, on its terms, works quite. I'm not. Yeah. I don't mean to say that I think 
there's a, 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 an obvious inferiority in those early no, but poems. Much but there's, ease, some, there's yeah. something much uh, more comfortable going on. There's a uh, Orpheus alone, which is again too long for us to yeah. hear, but it's Lavish. a two and a half page poem. It's only five sentences, if, if I yeah. recall correctly. Right. One of one, the first one goes on for some twenty lines or something yeah. like that, and it's perfectly at ease with itself. Um, something of that quality is in a shorter poem called um, "Always," and it also, it seems to me, has some of some of the uh, curious imaginative quality that you d began to develop pretty early, uh, uh, you, you, where you could posit this odd thing going on. Yeah. Just say, here is something weird happening, and then take off from there and, and take it. Well, I actually got this idea from a poem of Apollinaire's, which is also called Always, called Toujours, and in which he asks who the Christopher Columbus of forgetting will be. Who will be the first man to forget a continent? And I believe he was talking about who will be the first poet to forget all of 19th century French literature. That's <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, this is my version. It was a charming idea that it stayed with me. And this is uh, the result of my sort of ruminating on this. Always, always so late in the day in their rumpled clothes sitting around a table lit by a single bulb, the great forgetters were hard at work. They tilted their heads to one side, closing their eyes. Then a house disappeared, and a man in his yard with all his flowers in a row. The great forgetters wrinkled their brows. Then Florida went, and San Francisco, where tugs and barges leave small gleaming scars across the bay. One of the great forgetters struck a match. Gone were the harps of beaded lights that vault the rivers of New York. Another filled his glass, and that was it for crowds at evening under sulfur-yellow street lamps coming on. And afterwards Bulgaria was gone, and then Japan. Where will it stop? One of them said. Such difficult work pursuing the fate of everything known, said another. Down to the last stone, said a third, and only the cold zero of perfection left for the imagination. One of the great forgetters coughed, and gone were North and South America, and gone as well the moon. Another yawned, another gazed at the window. No grass, no trees, the blaze of promise everywhere. That's terrific. The blaze of promise everywhere, I think, as threatening as the as as what comes before it may be, the idea of losing everything. The blaze of promise everywhere is, I think, a note for us to end on. Okay. For, for you to have gotten there at this point is a great thing. Thank you. Thanks for being here. This has been a presentation of the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society.